Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, the head of the Australian Council of Social Services, Cassandra Goldie. The Liberal member for McKellar, Jason Filinski. Independent MP, Zali Stegall, who toppled former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. The Shadow Minister for Finance, Katie Gallagher, and the Economics Editor for the Australian newspaper, Adam Crichton. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. We've got plenty of great questions tonight. Our first one comes from the audience from Ricky Bartels. Ricky. Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask a question that's very near and dear to me. I have paid taxes for 46 years, you might be able to tell. Uh, I've worked 20 years in the private sector and 26 years in the public sector uh, for a not-for-profit community service. Um, at the age, uh, I was forced onto New Start at the age of 62 through change of management and subsequent retrenchment. I, I, I've been on, I spent, I've experienced New Start for over three years. Job Active left me to my own devices. I could not find a job no matter how hard I tried. So my question to you wonderful panellists is this. How would you, what would you or how would you suggest people like me have a goal to get a goal? Jason okay. Fidlinski, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, firstly, can I say uh, that's an extraordinary story and I'm, I'm sorry you've had to go through that. Um, I, I don't know enough about your personal circumstances to be able to properly comment on it and nor would I presume to know your life. Um, we have done a number of things in the uh, government to try and make sure that our system, which is a $172 billion welfare system per annum, is as bespoke as possible and responds to the needs of individuals as much as possible. It may be in your particular case we haven't been as successful as we need to be. Um, but we keep trying. Uh, Australia has a very successful uh, welfare and tax and transfer system in this country. It's one of the reasons that we have very high, high income levels, uh, high income mobility levels and very low levels of income inequality, uh, especially compared with other OECD nations. So um, I I'm happy to talk to you after the show, but... Well, we're going to talk a little bit on the show. Um, that's yeah. one of the great things about having questioners here in front of you. I'll quickly go back to Ricky. Uh, first of all, a quick response to, uh, to what Jason is saying. And, and can, can you give us some idea of how you lived for three years on the sum that Newstart offered you to live on? Well, put it in a nutshell, it's the worst time of my life. The loss of dignity. The loss of friends because you can't go out, you can't socialise. Not eating proper foods, even though I suffer various ailments. Um, looking for a job, applying for a job, not getting the job. There were three occasions where I got a small project job in community service. I'm a very skilled person. I've, done, I've, done, I've been a manager for settlement services for quite a long time. Um, so, for me, it was the worst time of my life. And Jason, with respect, you haven't answered my question. What do you suggest? People like me, at my age, or at a young age for that matter, you know, what, how do, do they have a goal to get a goal? This is so important. Have a goal. Get a goal. Mm. It's so divisive. Uh, Tony? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Ricky, uh, look, I can't... I can't tell you how, uh, I don't know enough about your life circumstances to comment. Mm. All, all I can say is, is that we as a government are doing as much as we possibly can to create a system that allow people to get as quickly from welfare to work as possible. We have a very highly targeted welfare system in this country. It has been very successful at ensuring that poverty levels and inequality are kept low. Um, if the system has, has failed you personally at, at your in your particular circumstances. I can only apologise for that. I'd love to know more and we'd love to create a system that is 
that make sure that what has happened to you doesn't happen to you. Okay, let's hear from Cassandra Goldie. Um, have you heard stories like this before um, and how <laughs> typical is that case? Ricky, great, great to see you here this evening. Um, and I know that there are other people in the audience who also know exactly what it's like. Um, and I want to say to you, Jason, it is not an... Everybody's story is unique, but at the same time, there is a huge problem with our social security system. Um, and in case you hadn't heard it, just about everybody else in the country agrees that New Start is unbearable. It is not working and it desperately needs to be increased to something that's livable after over 25 years of not having been increased in real terms. And it's an absolute travesty that we, as one of the wealthiest countries in the world, have refused to do what a good government would do so far. But I've got to say tonight, um, what has been very encouraging, Zali, good on you, sister. You said New Start needed to be increased. The Country Women's Association says that the New Start payment needs to be increased. The Australian Medical Association, all of the business groups, the union movement, uh, the leading economists, Adam, you too. I haven't been asked yet. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> says that New Start must be increased. You left out uh, John Howard. Uh, uh, John Howard. Of course, there are uh, uh, politicians across the political spectrum. Um, and the tide is only going in one direction um, to get this change that's so desperately needed. Can I say um, it's been so important. For, for too long, people have felt really silenced by this. There's a lot of shaming that goes on, isn't there, Ricky, you know, when, when this happens to you? And, and it happens to stress. young people. So can I just say, uh, I think that... Um, but more and more people Ricky was just gonna, speaking up. Ricky was just going to make a point there. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the mental strains, mm -hmm. you know, I was a frontline worker, I did conferences, I spoke at conferences, I wrote papers. And as you can see, I've lost my nerves now and I'm quite happy to speak. But your confidence goes zip. Uh, when everything in your life that you've cherished, and I want it to work till I'm 70, I love the work I did. Mm. And I took jobs. Uh, still in the sector, but not managerial. I was quite prepared that I may have to make adjustments. In other words, I believe not only have I had a goal for 46 years, I believe I had a goal on New Start, and I do not like hearing things like have a goal to get a goal. I do not like hearing things like this government will give, uh, uh, will only uh, hand up, not hand out, only recently said by our Prime Minister. What is that supposed to mean? Am I a hand out now? Let's, uh, let's go back to Jason and... Um, can I just put this to you? I mean, you might want to respond to that, but can I just put this to you? Um, it's clear the government's trying to protect its surplus. Um, so we've got the Prime Minister talking about unfunded empathy from the Labor Party. Um, he's clearly worried about the money. Um, if you get a surplus, will the situation change? Will the government raise a new start as so many people have called for? Um, so, Ricky, can I, can I firstly um, address the point that you made? No one in the government thinks that you're a handout. Um, this, this government and this country has always been about ensuring that no matter where you come from, what the circumstances of your birth are, that you get a chance to live your life to its full potential. Um, that is not to say that we are a perfect nation, because we're not. And there's a lot more that we can do to become a more perfect nation. And every government, regardless of wh who they are, is always trying to move their government, try to move the country in that direction. So quick one, Jason, because I've got to hear from the other panellists. So just sure. quick one. What I just asked surplus, was about well, if you get a surplus, will yeah. you raise new stuff? Well, what I would say to you, Tony, is this is... I know that there are people on the left who try to characterise this about as being about money. It's not. It's about saving lives. It's about moving people from welfare to work. And I'm happy to go through... OK, well, so if, if John Howard is one of those people, I'm happy to be in that camp. But yeah, well, let's, well let's no, just, no, can I say, I, I am allowed, I am allowed to OECD. disagree. Yeah. I am allowed to disagree. Sure. 
with John Howard. Okay. I think on this he's wrong. Fair enough. Zali. Look, I agree with the, the policy that we need to create opportunities and job opportunities to have <laughs> to, to get, get off the welfare. Because, yeah. But you, the welfare has to be at a level that you can live live uh, reasonably. You have to be able to still have that uh, quality of life, a standard. You can't have it where it pushes people so low and we, we talk about mental health issues and isolation and if the rate is so low, which it is, it is so, it's the lowest in OECD people countries. People are going without food um, every day. It, it is just, it, I think it's embarrassing for us as a nation that we haven't addressed it and raised it. The irony is we've got an economy that's flatlining and it needs a boost and we're, we, you know, we've addressed it with, with tax cuts and things that are coming into play. But the RBA has also come out saying that yeah. the boost of, of uh, raising new start would actually kickstart as well the economy and putting more funds Absolutely. into the system. So I think it has a multi-purpose and it should be, I think, nearly bipartisan. It should. There are people supporting it across the aisle and um, I certainly... Let, let's go to the other side of the aisle uh, to Katie Gallagher. And um, the Labor Party uh, didn't have the courage to say we're going to raise... New start uh, before the last election. You just said we're going to have an inquiry, which is, you know, you could argue the coward's way out. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterise it that way. I mean, we're in opposition. Um, you know, you don't have the resources of government to actually um, get the information from the Treasury and from the Department of Social Security to actually um, pull together a submission that would allow you to make those decisions as a cabinet. You can't do that from opposition. I mean, you just don't have those resources. You made a resources. lot of uh, promises so, from opposition and that wasn't one of them. Well, the promise from opposition was that we would have a review of New Start, and that was in recognition that we were getting representations from almost every sector of the community and the business community uh, more broadly to have a look at it and that it wasn't keeping pace with what uh, people in the community needed. So our position was that, and I think Bill Shorten said at the time, you don't have a review uh, to decrease a payment. You know, the, the review was genuine. If we'd won the election, it would be well underway. Um, and, you know, we didn't. Um, so our position is the government, this is firmly and squarely in the government's court. I think the language that's being used and Ricky's sort of given us how that matters as, at a very human level, um, you know, this language that the best form of welfare is a job, well, that's nice, but there's, you know, 1.8 million unemployed and underemployed people in this country and there's about 250,000 job vacancies. So, you know, no matter how hard someone tries, that's going to be really difficult for them. Uh, I think the language is divisive. It's, it's not the way Australia has uh, developed in terms of having a safety net for people when they need it. 20 years ago, I went on a social security payment completely, you know, out of the blue and without any fault of my own, not that that matters, uh, and it gave me a safety net to allow myself to get myself together. Um, and I think at this point in time, we're saying New Start doesn't provide that anymore and the government needs to sort it. This is one of the, the sort of the benefits of winning an election. Get on with it. Adam, um, as an economist, uh, we heard uh, Zali suggest that it would actually boost uh, a flagging economy to increase New Start because the money would go straight back into the economy, um, the retail level. Um, what do you think? Well, certainly it's likely that the extra welfare payments to uh, to people with very low incomes would uh, would likely be spent. Um, so I do agree with that. Uh, look, I mean, I, I don't. Neither side of politics basically has acted on this, and I think it's you know, I think it's really embarrassing. You know, I mean, you're sitting there, yet the Rudd Gillard government was in for six years, and they didn't really do anything about this. And this the third and term a call to government. have a review. I mean, you know, we might have the second lowest payment in the in the OECD, but we certainly have the most number of reviews of things, and I really think we need to stop the reviews and actually just act. I mean, you're quite right about the... Uh, you know, you're really quite right about the number of jobs. Uh, you know, the ABS said that there are 245,000 job vacancies in May. There's about 750,000 people on a new start. Of course, there's another 900,000 on the disability support pension. So I do think we need to recognise as a, as a society that this idea of dull bludgers really is wrong. I mean, certainly some people on the payment will be lazy and they won't seek work, but I do think the large majority of them do seek work. And, you know, who wants to live on $280 a week? Not many people. It's not very pleasant. Uh, and so I do think that there's definitely a case. I mean, it was last raised in 1994. Now, in that time, uh, a backbench MP's salary has gone up in real terms just under 100%. 
whereas the new start payment has not increased at all. Now, that's, that's just extraordinary. I'm going to quickly... I'll give the last word on this uh, to Ricky, since you raised the question. Um, imagine you're speaking now directly to the Prime Minister. What would you very briefly say to him? What do I have to...? Um, <laughs> OK, uh, Prime Minister, in your acceptance speech, you said that you would govern with compassion and strength and something else. But I, I, I focus on the words with compassion and mm -hmm. strength. So I would like to say to Scott Morrison uh, that you can be both compassionate and strong by increasing New Start. They actually work together. And there are n a number of ways if, if Adam, he wants a review, and, and Labor wanted to review, you could have said, we'll raise it 25 or $50 now, and after the review, we'll see whether there <laughs> could be raised more. Okay. These things can happen. Ricky, thank you very much uh, for you. raising the question and for prosecuting the case. Thank you very much. The next question is from Is Connell. Oh, hello. <laughs> Senate Estimates has been told that the robo-debt program costs almost as much as it recovers asks for money that isn't owed and puts considerable stress on vulnerable people. Given the widespread criticism of this poorly tar targeted and designed debt, cover <laughs> debt recovery initiative, what will it take for the government to stop this disastrous program and focus their efforts on other, fairer methods of increasing government revenue? OK, we'll keep this one a little briefer, but, Jason, starting with you, um, it's in the governments. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so I'm just going to be brief. There are other things in that Senate hearing as well. That $1.9 billion worth of uh, debts have been recovered, that there are $4.58 billion worth of debt still outstanding, that if you want to have a $172 billion welfare system that is properly targeted and designed to get people out of um, back to work and living their lives as best they can, you need to have integrity in that system. You can't do that unless you are um, collecting on debts. And by the way, we have a legal obligation to do that. Um, if you're making so much money from it, why not use human beings rather than robots? Well, the, uh, there are... Well, let's, let's be very clear. The first thing that... Ha well, there are nearly 32,000 people in the Department of um, Human Services and Centrelink. That's number one. Number two, the way that the um, income protect, uh, assurance system works is that people are initially sent a letter saying we have data matched um, between different things that are going on and we want to understand what is happening in your lives so that we can understand whether we have been paying you more or less money than we should have been doing. It goes both ways, by the way. Okay. And that's what happens. Uh, Cassandra, um, and I'll come back to our question who's got a hand up in a moment, but Cassandra, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, this uh, robo-debt system has been in operation now for three years, yeah? Um, the government has issued 500,000 alleged debts and on their own numbers, one in five of those has been wrong. And that's only been established, though, because people have had the guts, the tenacity to actually finally challenge the debts. We have no idea the number of people on very low incomes, often in very vulnerable circumstances, who have actually paid the money back because either they didn't realise how to challenge it, they were too fearful, all of those things. And we should remember that this is the government debt collection system, right? So, first of all, we stripped a lot of the human side out of it. So many of these debts alleged are wrong. And then, as it steamrolls on, government has the extraordinary powers to grab and come after you in a way that no private corporation is allowed to do. This is absolutely an abuse of government power. I'm, a, I'm really stunned, Jason, the government is not taking this far more seriously. We're having reports in the media very regularly now of people being tipped over the edge, cases of people taking their life after receiving this kind of notice. You have to understand what it's like to be on the other side of this as a government, a big government, comes after you 
when you don't know how to navigate that system. And so I really urge you to listen to how inhumane this is. And so many people have been so deeply distressed about it. Uh, the journalists have been doing your job people directly affected have been doing your job, speaking up. I'm just questioning what will it take for you to really be prepared to scrap this and acknowledge that you've got to get this right? I'm going to quickly go back to uh, our question because you had a hand up. Is Connell? Um, two comments. Not everyone is capable of working. I am. In the past, I wasn't. And not everyone can. Mm. And another thing, I read in the media recently that a robo-debt notice was sent to a man who had died six months previously. Where are the safeguards? What are you doing for the vulnerable people who are targeted by this? Do you actually care? Um, I'll go to Katie first, uh, because we haven't heard from you on this. Go ahead. Yeah, well, Labor has uh, said that we should stop this program. Uh, um, we've had too many cases coming to us of people who have been very distressed. Um, you know, I don't think... I don't know how many debt notices you've seen, Jason, but they don't, they're not written in a way that says, hi, we've got a few questions about how you're going. They're actually sent like a bill and they have, you know, you owe this and then it's, you know, up to you to appeal it or argue it. Uh, and certainly from experience I've had in Canberra, just walking around, people coming up to me, uh, very distressed. Um, and then there's obviously been the high profile media cases of people who are dying and, uh, or who have died and having claims against them. There's people who are having debts raised from 25 years ago. We've got the situation where in Townsville they've paused the program, um, presumably in recognition that it's quite distressing for victims of the flood up there. Um, you know, so the government's acknowledged uh, that in, in Townsville. So uh, I think this really does go to, again, the government working it out, providing the resources that are needed. We have no problem with um, collecting the money that's due. If there have been overpayments, that's part of the system. But, you know, the way it's been run at the moment, the high error rate, the fact that it relies on individuals to argue their case, and in some cases... Um, I've got colleagues in the parliament where 100% of the people that have come to hit their constituent office have had all of their debts waived and there's no transparency about that. If you don't appeal and you pay, maybe you shouldn't have. Um, there's, there's just no transparency. So we think the program should be stopped, resources should be provided and the government needs to get a grip on it. Uh, there's only a case for crossbench intervention here. I mean, you have intervened on other issues. We have, and I think uh, as independents on the crossbench, we tend to stand up for wanting probably integrity of process and really transparency and accountability. So it is concerning. Look, I did feel that uh, the minister in question time, and that came up a lot in our last week in, in Parliament, I did feel that he dealt with it and certainly apologised for the instances that had gone wrong. Um, I think it is a classic case of oversight by robots is probably not the best way to go. At the end of the day, get back to jobs and having real people uh, looking at the facts and the cases. I think especially when you're talking with highly vulnerable people where an oversight can have really dire consequences. Um, but there is that a compulsory, the mandatory obligation to report and to update your information. So there, you have to be reasonable as well that this is a, a system that does require accountability. Um, there has to be a process of debt recovery, but it has to be, I think, a little bit more uh, human and uh, uh, reasonable. OK, we've got quite a few questions to get to. Remember, if you hear any uh, doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question comes from Terry Jones. Terry. Uh, both major parties recently joined forces to block a move for an inquiry into allegations of special treatment for Crown Casino by MPs and public servants. I think there's, it's quite clear that there's strong... Uh, public support for an effective Commonwealth uh, Anti-Corruption Commission with sufficient powers and sufficient teeth to investigate allegations of undue influence by vested interests on decisions made by MPs and public servants. Why are both the major parties so strongly opposed to this? It makes me think, ask myself the question, what are they trying to hide? Why don't you MPs actually do your job, which is to represent the views of your constituents who I'm sure would like to see this happen. And if you're not prepared to do that, 
how else do you expect that the failing public conference, confidence in our political process will ever be restored? OK, I'm going to start with Zali again because the independents... <laughs> So the, the cost bench uh, were very strong on this in the past week, so I'll start with you, but then we'll hear from the... Uh, Absolutely. We cut a very lonely figure in Parliament, the five of us um, standing for a motion that, in fact, there be a joint uh, inquiry. Look, it has been reported off uh, for inquiry, but not to a body that has the power to properly investigate if there are any ministerial or any... Um, the corruption aspect. I think we've seen in the last 12 to 24 months a number of incidents that have come up where really Really, there is that complete loss of face when it comes to um, our politics and politicians and real concerns as to corruption and there really is a strong need for a National Anti-Corruption Commission. I mean, it just has to be done. We have uh, Cathy McGowan, previous independent member for INDI, put up a proposal. I know the Coalition Government have come on board with a proposal or flag that they will bring one on, but it has no teeth, it has no true accountability, uh, no... It needs to be a National uh, Anti-Corruption Commission that has fully funded, that has the capacity to have public hearings, that it can fully investigate. It can't just be reported by a body. So I think the public wants to know, the Australian people want to know that no one is above the law and that anything can be, that it can be investigated and cleared up. If the allegations are false, then I think it's in everyone's interest that we clear it up. But Crown was a classic example of, come on, what's it going to take? Uh, just a quick one on this. Yes, you were in Parliament, so you... You said you cut lonely figures uh, on the crossbench. And so my question briefly is, do you know why or do you think you know why both the major parties had no appetite for an open parliamentary inquiry into this? Well, we've had both both sides of politics in government. We had six years of, of Labor. We're now on a third term of coalition and no-one comes forward with a decent anti-corruption commission. So mm. the real question so is Do you think it's specifically not? about Crown in this case? Crown, well, look, we, gambling uh, lobby is pretty powerful. Uh, I know both major parties accept uh, political um, donations from, from Crown uh, and gambling, so there is a real question of why not? Okay. Uh, and I certainly don't want to cast aspersions, but if you're not prepared to have it investigated, why not? Jason. Yes, Tony. How can I help? Um, <laughs> so I'm, well, you I'm can have an open you, inquiry into this to start I'm, with. Well, I'm afraid you guys have been misled. Uh, the government has referred this to the Australian Law Commission for um, Enforcement Integrity. It has powers that a parliamentary committee could never have and it will investigate um, these allegations quite clearly with the powers that it possesses. And members of parliament will be subject to that investigation if, there are, if those allegations are proven to be upheld. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, the government is uh, designing uh, the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, um, it will have a budget of $107 million. It will look at many of the things that you're talking about and it will have teeth. Uh, we have seen during the week people make claims about members of parliament being corrupt, but when asked to actually give specifics of that allegation, they're not willing to do so. The biggest thing undermining our politics at the moment is irresponsible allegations without, without actual proof. And I would say we're sitting in the state of New South Wales at the moment. We have seen the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption essentially um, become a kangaroo court with show trials. And innocent people, hundreds of innocent people, have had their lives destroyed because this commission didn't go, went for headlines instead of trying to root out corruption. But that's rubbish. The, the, the model that's been proposed is on the basis of an analysis of all the commissions that are around all the states of Australia. It's not just about what's happened in New South Wales. We have had very good operating bodies in other states and the, body, the, the proposal from an anti-corruption point of view is actually taking the best of all of our systems, not just New South Wales ICAC. Um, Sorry. I'm, I'm going to go to uh, Katie Gallagher. It does seem to be uh, people are probably getting a glimpse as to how you won that election. Um, <laughs> Katie. Well, uh, Labor does uh, support an anti-corruption commission or, or a body of that type. We went to the election with that policy. Um, in terms of the issues around Crown Casino and the allegations that were raised, we did think um, that the government's response to have it 
dealt or have it investigated by the Australian Enforcement Integrity Commission was a good first step. We have left open, um, you know, based on what that investigation finds, any further action that needs to be done. And indeed, the Senate actually passed a motion, I think on Thursday, to require the leader of the government in the Senate to come into the Senate on the next sitting day and explain what the Prime Minister has done in relation to investigating any concerns that have been made about ministers uh, or MPs. No one's been named, as Jason says. Um, uh, there's just been allegations there, but we do want to know whether the Prime Minister has followed this up and what investigations he's asked his department to undertake, whether it's speaking with the, the people that have made the allegations and come back uh, to the parliament. So... Why, uh, didn't, why didn't you support, just out of interest, um, uh, Labor supporter Parliamentary Joint Committee, which was the inquiry, which was what the crossbench yeah. were after? Um, they said they felt lonely. Labor clearly wasn't going to join them. Well, look, I'm in the Senate, so I missed all the excitement in the House. Everyone says the House is the exciting place to be. Um, I presume you talk to your colleagues. I do talk to them from time to time. Um, <laughs> uh, my understanding was, uh, and again, not being there, was that the form formation of the committee was not representative of the Parliament. Um, now, um, you know, we have 68 members in the House of Reps. There's six crossbenchers. Um, you know, there was an overrepresentation of them on the committee. And look, to be honest, if everyone's seen how parliamentary committees work, um, they don't necessarily have the powers uh, or the independence uh, that the body that the government has referred it off to has. Uh, and we think that is an appropriate first step. I don't think, seriously, that a, uh, you know, whole, a widely represented crossbench, Liberal and Labor politicians on a committee is the right body to investigate nameless allegations about ministers and members of parliament uh, doing the wrong thing. It's so just nothing, not nothing to do, just, just to confirm, nothing to do at all with Labor's connections, historical connections to Crown? Uh, none at all. And look, I've, you know, speaking from personal experience, I've had nothing to do with Crown. Like, it's just a... Oh, two of the key power brokers from the New South Wales Labor Party, well, Mark and people, Bill. People who were in the Carl Labor Bittar. Party years ago have, yeah. have jobs there, yeah. But I think that's... It's a bit of a bow to say that that implicates the whole of the federal caucus in some conspiracy, because it's simply not correct. Okay. All I right. mean, uh, our questioner has his hand up. Let's quickly go back. Well, I was just going to say, doesn't this highlight why we need a decent, proper national... Anti-corruption commission. That. Well, that, Jason, what, Jason, we says, Jason says the government that's is building well. What's the smoking gun, though? Uh, for such a corruption it, it, commission. It, I, I want to say to the crossbench that have been doing this work, more power to you. Um, you've also all supported an increase to New Start. More power to you on that. Uh, from Bob Catter right through to Adam Band. Um, sometimes this is about hearing what the community is really saying needs to change. Um, we don't want any more of the Labor, Liberal, you know, it's all about politicking. It's actually, as you say, if there are serious allegations... Let's do precisely with, that, uh, Cassandra, go back to the community. Wherever they come from. So our questioner, oh, sorry, our questioner had his hand and up. And if they're not, then they are dismissed. <laughs> uh, just one, one second, Cassandra, I'll come back to you. Uh, our questioner had his hand up. Okay. Go ahead, Terry. Uh, look, quite honestly, the response that I got from both the major parties doesn't wash it with me. I mean, if you look back, not just at the, the Crown business, but you look back at a number of the other things that have come up in, you know, the last few decades, I think the uh, culture of secrecy and uh, lack, of lack of transparency in politics in this country has been deteriorating for probably at least 20 years. Yeah. Okay. And it's got to the point where there are so many transactions that I can run off in the last 12 months that just to use a phrase that politicians often use, doesn't, don't pass the pub test, right? Mm. I mean, you look at some of the water buybacks, for example. And the grasslands. And you could look at the grasslands. I mean, <laughs> okay, I, we'll can, get... I can go on, but anyway. Well, well, you could because you've got a team effort down there, but, uh, <laughs> which is great, yeah. but we're, we're going to throw she, it back. She's, she's my political advisor. That's fantastic. <laughs> But, 
So, look, <laughs> quick, quick, I round up your point and I, um, I will round up my point by saying what all these answers have convinced me that if we want to see more accountability and transparency in politics, what we need is more independence in Parliament and less party people. Okay. <laughs> all right. Nothing wrong with the two of you responding, by the way. I wasn't meaning to imply that. Now, Adam, you were, you were talking about no smoking gun. What do you want to say? Well, look, I think the first point to make is that Australian politics isn't perfect, obviously, but on, on most indices around the world, we are one of the least corrupt countries, and I just don't see why you would make such a big structural change, basically following on from something that was on 60 Minutes. I mean, that is, that is hardly the reason to, to change and to introduce a body which, you know, which is going to be a picnic for lawyers, basically. I mean, are you see implying all the judges, that the, all the lawyers because it was on 60 back. Minutes, it was somehow less no, well, I'm just saying relevant as journalism? No, but this is a huge... <laughs> what is, no, but what is being pay? proposed... Funny, funny you would focus on What that. is being proposed is basically... <laughs> The sort of commission that emerges in countries like Italy and Brazil when there are serious, serious cases of corruption. Basically, a new legal body that comes out with all of these extraordinary powers and you just can't predict how it's going to behave. Just as Jason said, we've seen in Western Australia and also New South Wales, these entities can basically go feral. They have a lot of power. They can go and search journalists' homes. I mean, if you don't like what happened to the ABC journalist and the News Corp journalist, then you should not be supporting a commission like this because they can be extremely powerful. Now, we have a parliament and... Most importantly, you have a free media. And the free media is definitely the best and the cheapest, I would add. So do you know, uh, do you know any cases of ICAC searching journalists' homes? Because, I, of course, we know the federal police have been doing that. But as but I, I understand the proposal that has been put forward uh, by the crossbench, that such a commission could actually do that. If OK, they well, uh, Zali better respond to that briefly. I, I think that the basis of the commission that's being put forward is being proposed by a number of eminent retired Supreme Court judges. Of course, the legal so, profession. Mm. Of course well, they want this. Because with it, due because respect, it helps what lawyers. is it going to take? I mean, you've got the Great Barrier Reef, $440 million of Australian taxpayers being allocated without tender or, or proper process. $420 million to uh, Paladin Group. We've got the $80 million in the Eastern Australian Agriculture. We've got appointments of politicians and ministers sure, agree, staffers the to the AAT. The we have no process of review. There is True, no accountability. You know, but we have a police force in every state. We have the federal police, we have so many different crime commissions, plus we have a free media which has brought all of these things to attention. And of course, we have other MPs as well who have a hugely powerful incentive to rat on the other side. And so I, I just The free media doesn't to... have the power to compel it's testimony, true. which is one it's of the true. things these... But we have no shortage of royal do. commissions in this country. I mean, we have more royal commissions than any other country on earth by far. And so if something really bad does... The suggestion here is commission. effectively a standing royal commission to look at the integrity of government. Well, yes, and I just think that that is a big step into the unknown for a country which is as clean as Australia compared to... <laughs> oh, I can't go back to you. <laughs> We've got to go to another question. We've got to move on. Next question is from Felicity Rafferty. Hi, panel. Liberal Party staffers are complaining of sexual harassment. We've got the Minister for Women in the last government resigning as a result of difficulties juggling her Canberra portfolio with her domestic responsibilities. In the current uh, House of Representatives, there are 11 of 44... Uh, Liberal MPs are women. Are Liberal women in Parliament expected to toe the party line? That is to say that there's nothing to see here. Just as Adam Goods was expected as an Aboriginal football legend and Australian of the Year to keep quiet about the prejudice that he faced. Jason. Uh, absolutely not. Um, there are a couple of things you missed out there. For example, we have a record number of women in Cabinet now. Um, I, I've sat through two weeks of first speeches in the House of Representatives and the diversity of the, num of the new members that have come in for the Liberal Party, both in terms of background, experience, skills and gender, is quite extraordinary. What's your uh, um, percentage of uh, I can't, women? Me, in, I can't uh, tell you off the top of my head, sorry. 36% apparently. Okay. So, it's about, it's thank about, you, Cassandra. It's about... Um, um, I don't think it is. Yes. And, and, and we're ranked about 48 I think it's Globally, in yeah. terms of being well, low. Low, yeah, in the That's, parliament. Yeah. It's low. Jason, can I just ask you, these abuse oh. claims from these women, do they tell you something about the culture of the party? Because they're suggesting there's some kind of misogynist culture within the party. Well... Does that worry you? Yeah, that does worry me. It does worry me from the perspective that we are a broad-based political party without the sort of institutional support that other parties have. So we rely on members joining our party. We rely on them being active. 
And if there is a culture where certain people feel that they're unwelcome or that they're not, um, or we don't want them involved, that's a massive problem for or us. Or that they're being shut up when they or have they're abuse being shut claims. up. Exactly. How disturbing so, is that? So the abuse claim is really disturbing. But I think Katie and, and look, any member of a political party would say political parties are not set up to deal with a claims of sexual abuse. That is the purview of the police, and rightfully so, because they're very serious claims. Where there is a problem with um, environments in which people don't feel comfortable being there, that's a problem that we have to face up to, and one that the federal executive faced up to on Friday, and it's an ongoing project. Um, Sandra, you obviously want to respond. Keep it brief if I you would do, I do. Um, I do. Jason, I don't think it is correct to say that uh, a political party has no role here. I mean, no corporation, no employer anywhere else would get away with saying that. Um, in fact, it's it, it, the, the codes of conduct, the expectations around the responsibility of an employer um, to ensure that if there is an allegation of this kind of conduct, uh, that the employer does all things reasonably within their power to ensure that that person is supported, that they feel able to bring forth that complaint, for you to take action to investigate it, including to support them to go to the police if they choose to do that. This is a, a, an, an environment in where it's very difficult for a person to pursue that on their own. For, for no other employer, and when they do, um, if you pursue it legally, you get in big trouble to just go, oh, not our job, you go off to, and tell the police about it. Um, the employer has a responsibility to support that person right through the process. OK, um, so, Tony, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm right, not, yeah. sorry. We, I, I need to be clear, I'm talking about the difference between harassment and sexual abuse. Mm. One is an act, a criminal act. In the two women that came forward, um, one has said that she was supported in going to the police and she decided that she didn't want to go to the police. I don't know what more you believe the Liberal Party could have done in that particular instance. But we have a Should you root out culture. a culture of harassment if, and if there make is sure a, that the where people there who is, are doing it are where, not members anymore? Where, where there is harassment of anyone on any basis, they will, let me be very clear, rooted out and expelled from the Liberal so Party. So what do you think about the notion that someone went to one of these women and said, how would you feel if I'm this appalled. person was put up for pre-selection? I'm absolutely appalled that The that person happened. who did this to you. That, that is absolutely appalling. Mm. And I can't, I, I honestly, if that hadn't been put on the record, I would tell you there's no way that would have happened. So ha are the people responsible, have they been rooted out? Well, that, in that particular instance, mm. there are ongoing inquiries and I believe if that person is discovered mm. and um, the person making that allegation is willing to um, uh, identify that person, yes, they will be rooted out. OK, um, I'll quickly go back to our question. If Felicity had, it, had your hand up. Yeah, I, I guess the, the, the feeling that I have uh, with regarding um, how women are me meant to feel within Liberal Party ranks is that it's OK if you just go about being nice little ladies, but if you stick your head up above the parapet and say we have a problem here, that's just not on. So I guess I need to say to that, that and I know you're not mean, meaning to be that way, but that is highly offensive to my female colleagues in the parliament and none of them are like that. None of them will put up with the sort of nonsense that has been described in the media. We have a very strong culture of empowering people regardless of their gender. OK, um, I've got to ask you this, Ali. Um, does it make you think twice about the, even the possibility of joining the Liberal Party? I'm because, a proud uh, independent. Yeah. Um, Will you remain a proud independent? It's one of the questions. We've got a lot of uh, questions yeah, along those lines. Uh, do you intend to remain a proud independent throughout your time in Parliament? Or is there any chance you could join the Liberal Party? Look, I, I've answered this question a lot. The irony is on one, one day I get asked or assume that I'm going to defect to the Liberal Party and another day I'm a, I'm a Labor stooge and a get-up activist and then I've got a Green staffer and then I've got everything. So I think a lot of people have trouble... You're saying you wouldn't fit in the Liberal Party? Ex people just have trouble categorising what an independent is and ironically I think it's the truest form of representation of your electorate because I'm not beholden to a party line, I'm beholden to my electorate and I've made it clear. 
I am there to represent the, my electorate as an independent and that's what I'm doing. But what I find interesting with the question, for example, on this issue is are our political parties only kind of starting to come to terms with the expectations that all our corporations have had to deal with for a long time already from a legal point of view, mm. from a, an, a quotas, equity, proper representation, more diversity within the parties, um, how, do we, how do they deal with sexual abuse complaints or discrimination? And, and I feel like in the corporate world, it's, it's, it all happened some time ago. Not perfect, still a long way to go, mm. but it's a process. Maybe the, the, the political parties are sort of a bit late to the party of getting, getting on with this. I'm just going to bring Katie uh, in and so Adam wants to get in as oh, well. Just, just briefly ahead. on the corporate point, I mean, do we really have any evidence that things are so much better in the corporate world? I mean, I would say from first principles that, I mean, our politicians are under far more scrutiny than people in the corporate world because of the media attention. And so if they won, I mean, if they, if they stop off once, their entire career is over, mm. whereas that is not the case in the corporate world. So I just think this, this kind of constant beating up on politicians uh, because of, you know, so-called cultural reasons just, just ignores that these things can be just as bad in the corporate world, but we just don't focus on it. Adam, we're, we're talking about our political leaders here and the Australian Parliament. Yeah. Surely we should be saying, you would want, Jason, for you to set the standard. You know, that's, that's what we're after here. But these, yeah. Sorry, uh, Katie, I'm going to bring you in uh, before we run out of time. Go ahead. Uh, look, I think the first thing to say is that, uh, you know, the political parties have to deal with this and it has been an issue that <coughs> you know, and I think we see. Uh, certainly there's been issues in the Greens party from time to time. You know, I'm sure the Labor Party is not perfect. Um, the Labor Party isn't the employer of staffers. I think that's the only point I'd add to Jason's is when the staffer if they're employed in a political office, they do have an employer and that employer has obligations which so so those staff do have, you know, support. Um, I would have to say, though, in terms of the stuff that's been going on in the Liberal Party, I just, you know, it's unusual, but I'd like to support the words that um, Jason has said. I think he's been quite outspoken and, and you know, it's still, politics is still a male-dominated um, profession and, you know, I, I think I've been in politics for 20-odd years you know, um, you know, women have had to fight to have systems put in place that support their involvement in political parties. In the Labor Party, there's more of us. We've probably been a bit more shouty and we've got the policies in place. Um, and, you know, we have other support networks that are w women's groups within the party that support that. But, you know, the Federal Caucus, we're 46% uh, female now, you know, it's, um, you know, the boys are starting to look around and what's happening here. But um, I would say that, uh, you know, we need men like Jason who are going to say that what happened, the allegations that have been in the paper are wrong, shouldn't happen because that will bring forward cultural change within political parties because it's not so simple as just having a policy. It is actually changing culture and that's where you need leaders to actually stand up and say it's not OK this is the way we're going to do things. And, you know, I think credit where credit's due. OK, we're going to move on. Um, completely different subject. Garonwi Price has a question for us. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, in Canada and the United States, there are many small entrepreneurial companies now uh, pioneering nuclear batteries. In effect, uh, nuclear, nuclear batteries, small-scale radio... Uh, small-scale power plants. The... These can be powered by thorium and they have several benefits, one of which is uh, thorium and molten salts. They cannot melt down. Uh, they do not convert to plutonium, so they can't be, uh, be weaponised and they potentially could be produced in factories, so they're many, many times cheaper than conventional power plants. Are they using them anywhere? They, they, there, is, there are applications in, in Utah now, uh, the first, so they're, they're just coming off the line. There's none, as, as far as I know, actually installed, but there's one that's being improved, approved currently. Um, the idea is that after you've built them, after you've made them, it can be buried. Uh, they're very small. You bury it, it's a, it's a sealed system and then you take it away 25 years later. A small unit in my back garden in Warringah 
would, be, would have enough to power the electorate for 25 years and, and then it could be taken could away, assuming the body corporate would allow Would you be, you'd, you'd be happy to... You're obviously a member of Zali's electorate. Would you, would you be happy to have one in your electorate? Certainly, I'd be happy to have one in my back garden. I'd be happy to have one... You could put one under the quarantine station on North Head. On North Head. OK. They are safe. There's a, there's a major nuclear power plant in the suburbs of Toronto. Mm. Uh, I think we have a unreasonable fear of nuclear energy. Okay, let's uh, let's go to uh, Zali first because it's your electorate. Um, can you imagine this? Um, because you want zero emissions, um, it's critical uh, for climate change uh, in your way of looking at it. So why not think about the new generation of thorium nuclear reactors as a way of doing this? Look, I, again, we have to find the solutions. We need to go towards uh, a zero emission and there's no doubt that we have to investigate all the options. Uh, we do know renewables are the cheapest source uh, as it stands and my understanding is nuclear has a cost element. Uh, but, look, the Energy uh, Minister has just referred to the... To the uh, committee on which I am, um, we will be investigating. Do you feel, do you feel agnostic about the source of power? For example, a form of nuclear power which was cleaner than traditional nuclear power, like thorium batteries that he's referring to, would you be prepared to go into that with an open mind? Um, well, I think we, we, we have a duty to investigate all possibilities. The question, though, is you have there's a lot of factors that need to be looked at. Uh, mm. And I think at the end of the day, there's also uh, social acceptance is mm. a big part of it. It has to be acceptable to the community. I'm not sure how the rest of Warringah would feel uh, about your proposal. Um, so, and you have to weigh it up with what else alternatives are available. And look, mm. the beauty is that that's what uh, can be investigated and uh, I do have an open mind in terms of uh, looking at it. Okay. Um, personally, I, I do feel that we there is a duty to find the safest, cheapest source of power. All right, uh, let's go to Jason because Angus Taylor has uh, suggested that we need another inquiry. There was one, um, the, Z the Zwitkowski inquiry during John Howard's time. That was, of course, before uh, these kind of thorium reactors even existed? Well, um, well, they still don't quite exist yet, but mm -hmm. um, they're a long further down the line. Look, I, I, I agree with Zali. We need to, um, you know, have an open mind on different power sources that are available, in particular ones that don't produce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I think the, the, the issue with renewable energy is that whereas a coal-fired power station or a gas turbine can create electricity permanently or in a dispatchable sense, you need to combine renewable energy with batteries and that's what sends the economics of that right out of whack. So when you put that into um, the equation, what you end up with is a nuclear uh, reactor um, becomes quite cost-effective in comparison. And so do you, do you feel that's a good way to go? A lot of your colleagues are now talking openly about this as a possibility. Um, once again, I, I'm going to keep an open mind. It's part of an inquiry. I don't think that I should, uh, but is on Angus, Q&A, reach is Angus, a conclusion. Is Angus Taylor going down the right path here, opening up an inquiry? Well, Ang John Howard had one, an yeah. extensive one, well, and that, decided that... it was too expensive, would take too long and too many political obstacles. So it was 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed. Um, and, yes, I think we need to explore all options. That's Tiny right. time is ticking. You know, we have... the Are talking about the program to, or the uh, planet? ..available to us, <laughs> cl the climate crisis. OK, right. Actually, last time I checked, it's not like we've got forever to think about these things. We don't. Hmm. You know, here so we have... You're in favour, are you? Yes. You're in favour of a, a new we, we, Why are we investigating something that could maybe, when we absolutely know we've got the best technology in terms of renewables, we should be getting behind and investing in that as rapidly as we can? The renewables are never going to achieve it. I mean, if we uh, want to get to zero carbon, I mean, Adam, the overwhelming bulk of Australia's energy still comes from gas and coal, and yet we focus every day in the media on these so-called renewables. I mean, even if you look at the Western oh, world, they are still so single-digit percentages. <laughs> no, they are... Well, they are single-digit percentage contribution. I mean, it's, it's just so absurd that we are the only country in the G20 with a complete ban on nuclear energy. I mean, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. We have a third of the world's uranium. Can we just be clear about one thing? They're not so-called renewables, they are renewables. <laughs> sure, but they still... No, but it creates the impression that they're free. Like, sure, the marginal cost is free at some times of the day. Indeed, on the 22nd of July, it was for the first time. The marginal cost of energy was free and everyone's like, oh, wow, free power. But, you know, what's going to happen at night time? I mean, you still need... 
Oh. You still need power at night time. And oh you know, everyone says, oh, well, you know, there'll be battery technology. But that's just assuming that the rate of progress in battery technology will just, will just continue upward and upward forever. And then it's just all going to work out perfectly. The reality is, on current technology, there is no way that, that with solar and wind and hydro, uh, you will get to zero emissions. We absolutely need nuclear. I mean, I just came back from Chicago. I spent three months there. And in the, in the state of Illinois, they have 10 nuclear power stations, 10. And the cost of electricity there is a third what it is in New South Wales. One third. And then in France as well, I think they have something like 30 nuclear power stations. Their, their power is much cheaper than I don't want to see so all this business nuclear. about it being so expensive it's just wrong. in this country and Sally do you want but I mean, why this, this reality I mean, Chernobyl was built in the got, 70s we've got available to us renewable energy sources that we should be absolutely investing but the battery technology is not there as quickly as we can if we're worried about energy bills there's a bundle of things that we can do we know people on low incomes all the solutions that are people available low energy incomes, power bills have gone up about 100% get, in get the all the houses that's around terrible the for people actually, on low okay I'll tell you what I'm going to do here I'm just going to say hang on a sec I'm going to say we're now going speak. into another review. Hang on a sec, Cassandra. You need to speak Not well. independently <laughs> of each other. So <laughs> very good at review. OK, you're both talking over each other. So, Cassandra, finish your point. And I'm going to go back to you, Adam, because it does take a long time to build a nuclear reactor. They are very expensive. And that's what Switkowski found. Um, there'll be a 30-year time period to actually get one up. Uh, that's going back then. Um, have you looked into this now? How long would it take to build even one in Australia? Well, certainly the technology has improved a lot since, uh, since that review. But the, I mean, it, as I understand it, our various emissions targets do relate to 20, 30 years into the future. So we do have to act now if we're going to do this. They do take a long time to build, but, but there are smaller modular ones that are being yeah. developed. I mean, the state of Ontario in Canada is now 60% nuclear. Uh, so, you know, we really do have to act now. I mean, I'm not for a review. I think, I think the major parties have to get together. They have to agree. I mean, it really is so disappointing that Labor's come out and basically poo-pooed this idea because it's, it's not in the national interest, really, to say this. Let's, let's hear what Labor says. Go ahead. Yeah, so our view is um, this is, uh, well, yet another review. Uh, we don't believe uh, that Angus Taylor is genuine about this. I think this is him distracting from the rather difficult month he's had in politics and also the fact that they've had 15 failed energy policies in the last six years. I, you know, my feedback from the community when I'm, I'm talking to people is they want to get on now picking up Cassandra's point. Uh, they want action now. They want a national energy policy now that the government has failed to deliver and, you know, we've lost prime ministers over. Uh, and this is something that has been tested before the Australian community a number of times since 1950 uh, and has been rejected every single time. Um, you know, uh, the view of, I think, the people I represent is you know, first believe climate change is real, that it's happening and that we need a policy to deal with it. And that's something that this government in three terms and six years hasn't been able to deliver. If nuclear energy was safe, would you still be against it? Well, I think there's issues that around nuclear energy. It's, it's about uh, the location, it's about the use of water, it's about the cost, it's about the length of time uh, to construct, it's the, it's the construction period and the emissions throughout that. I mean, there's a whole range of issues that have to be uh, looked at if you were genuine about it. But, um, you know, there, it is, I think, uh, saying, oh, we're going to do all this busy work over here about something that might happen in 30 years, but actually what's happening now and what people want to see Just now location, is though. action happening now. Already. Okay. Yes, but this would be a new so we're, one. We're running out of time rapidly. This would just, be a new you, one. You can, Gromwe, you had a very long question, but you can make a very short... Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. No one's saying don't use renewables, don't use storage, mm. but climate change is an emergency. Mm. Here we are, it's like we're going to war and leaving our tanks and our artillery and our aircraft back in the hangar and saying we can't mm. use them. Nuclear power works. The countries that are producing all their energy emissions free, like France, Sweden, Ontario. It's all done with nuclear power okay. and some renewables. All right, Adam, I think you made your point for you. So we'll move on. In three weeks' time, we'll have Q&A's 2019 high school special when senior high school students join the panel to discuss Australia's future with today's politicians. So we want Australia's political leaders to meet the leaders of tomorrow. So head to our website and upload your audition video. Our next question comes from Hallie. McGree. 
A recent survey showed that one in eight men believe they could win a point off Serena Williams in a game of tennis. <laughs> Do you believe these results would be different if the subject of the survey was a top male tennis player? And do you think that this shows sexism is still prevalent in sport? Sally, uh, I'll, st <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, put you on the um, downhill and let you go. Uh, good luck anyone <laughs> taking a point off Serena Williams yeah. is all I can say. Um, she's powerful, she's absolutely fantastic. Um, look, sexism does still exist, there's no doubt about it, but um, you have to tackle it head on and it's girls like you, it's the next generation that have to do it. Um, we all do our bit. It's why I'm here. It's why I stood for Parliament this year. Um, I thought it was really important that we needed more women in Parliament, more representation. I've come up across sexism, whether it's been my sporting career, legal, at various times. Um, you have to call it out and you have to stand your ground. So, um, yeah, sport is a it's a tricky it's a tricky one, but you just have to go for. It. I think the growth in women's sport has been fantastic. I think back to 20 years ago, we had a handful of individual sports person sports women that could get a few sponsors, and you could get yourself um, enough profile to survive in sport. Now we have leagues, we have sports. We need to see pay equity. We need to see the women's teams getting the same pay as the guys. Um, but at least they're starting to get a little bit more recognition and coverage, and I think often much better to watch. I must say I'm a bit surprised about this question because it was 1974, I think, when uh, Bobby Riggs challenged oh, yes. Billie Jean King, and it seems a bit, that question seems a bit of a throwback to that weird time. I thought we might have advanced a little further than that. Yeah, and look, it's one of those things that you're not comparing apples with apples. They're different, often different sports. It's not a question of saying, well, is a guy stronger than a woman, and so is that a test of strength? It's about you've got different sports. You know, you don't ask a 100 metre sprinter to run the 10K and say, well, one's a better athlete than the other. They're doing different sports. And and so I think male and female sport needs to be respected and recognised and celebrated for what it is. Um, and that's up to the public to really let everyone know what they want to see and what they want to watch. Um, you know, I've got boys and girls at home. I want them all to participate in sport. I encourage the kids, kids from the electorate. I want everyone to get out there and get active. I'd like to throw that around to everybody, but I'm told we're out of time. So <laughs> that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, whether they're going to play tennis or not. Cassandra Goldie, Jason Filinski. Zali Stegel, Katie Gallahan, Adam Crichton.